there's your notification. Um, before I hand things over to tonight's speaker, um, I would like to first thank Tin Mountain's Nature Program Series sponsors, and those are White Mountain Oil and Propane, Ragged Mountain Equipment, and Hancock Lumber. And um, so I do want to thank them for their continued financial support. Um, I also want to put a plug in for a few of our upcoming programs. Um, as I said, we're excited. This is, you know, sort of our kickoff to, um, you know, to our 2022 series, uh, nature program series. Um, and next Thursday, we have a program by geology uh, professor at Bates College, Dykstra Houston, will be doing um, a presentation, uh, his second for us on the topic of geology of the presidential range. So very fitting, this nice thematic start to the year, uh, thinking about those big snowy mountains. Hopefully they'll have even more snow in them in the future. Um, and then on Wednesday, February 2nd, Roundhog's Day, our environmental book group will be discussing our um, our monthly read, which uh, for February is Plastic Ocean by Charles Moore about um, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And then the following night, Tuesday, sorry, Thursday, February 3rd, we have Rick Vanderpool will be presenting um, a tracking evening program followed by a field program for those interested on the 5th. And you can find more information about any of those programs on our website. Um, but tonight we are very excited to have Georgia Murray with us. She is a staff scientist at the Appalachian Mountain Club. She's also the lead author of the recent publication on climate trends on the highest peak of the Northeast. Mount Washington. So please join me in welcoming Georgia. Thank you, Nora. So I'm going to um, share my screen here and get it going. So hopefully that shows up just fine. Okay. Yes. Great. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate everyone's time tonight uh, to share our study about climate change in the White Mountains. And um, I wanted to um, start with a quick outline. I'll do a brief introduction about um, the AMC for those of you who aren't familiar, um, but spend a good chunk of time going over the results of our climate change indicators study and also introduce a way that you could get involved in tracking climate change in the White Mountains uh, by participating in the Community Snow Observation Program. So those of you that might be less familiar with the AMC, we're the oldest conservation organization uh, in the nation. And our mission is to foster the protection, enjoyment, and understanding of the outdoors. And we do conservation work across the Northeast uh, where we work on steward, stewardship and managing trails, getting involved in advocacy and policy related to our mission, working to protect lands and expand outdoor access. And last but not least, we, my role as a research staff scientist is to conduct science and monitoring and bring that science-based perspective to our conservation policy and positions. So today, uh, the work that I'm gonna talk about um, couldn't have happened without so many people that have been involved over the years. Uh, we're talking about a data set, data sets have been collected since the 30s. Um, so that includes AMC staff, night watchmen collecting data, um, and also uh, our partner, long-term partner, the Mount Washington Observatory and their many staff and observers have been collecting quality and consistent hourly and daily weather observations that allow us to look back over many decades to evaluate um, whether the climate has changed. But first I wanted to start with a global perspective um, from the latest scientific analysis of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, which came out earlier this year, adding and confirming to the consensus that our climate is warming and emissions from fossil fuel burning is a major climate driver, is the major climate driver. So what we're looking at here, the panel, um, um, these panels show 
changes in temperature with time. The panel on the left shows the last 2000 years uh, with the dramatic increase uh, to current day above all other uh, reconstructed data. And the panel on the right shows the last 170 years where the solid black line is the observed temperature change. The green uh, along the bottom is the estimate of temperature change caused by natural climate drivers, such as um, solar and volcanic uh, drivers. And the brown is showing the combination of natural drivers along with the human impacts. And you can see that that uh, matches the black line quite well. In other words, this is uh, evidence that human activities are ca causing the increase in temperature. And so zooming in a little bit here uh, to uh, a more local region, this is a study by Contasta et al. in 2019, where they looked at uh, sites with 100 years of data across the northern forest. You can see the green uh, area of the map. Um, and they found that winter condition and winter is changing the most dramatically. Uh, the northern forest region is losing the cold, 20 fewer frost days losing the snow, 19 fewer uh, days with snow cover, and the overall winter season is shortening uh, by about three weeks in this region. So what about mountains? Um, are, are they any different? Uh, some researchers have proposed that mountains uh, are could be climate change refugia, or basically areas where uh, they resist or remain relatively buffered from climate change. Uh, slower changes in mountains may allow time for adaptation of some wildlife or could serve as sky island, uh, sky islands for relic plant populations as we have here in the, um, the Northeast Alpine zone. Um, so understanding climate trends in mountains will really help us determine whether they could maintain cold conditions and allow us to consider climate resistance, adaptation, and mitigation for these mountain habitats as we plan for the future. So here in New Hampshire, we're lucky enough to have um, two robust climate data sets, one at Pinkham Notch, where my office is uh, at the AMC, and the other at the top of Mount Washington. And these sites are unique in that uh, there's very few sites at these elevations with such a long record. Um, and so what AMC has done is we've basically built on um, some previous analyses. Grant et al. in 2005 first looked at the temperature record for the summit. Um, and then that was updated by Seidel et al. in 2009. Um, AMC was part of that publication where we updated the record through, uh, added a few more years of data, but also looked at the snow records at these sites. And then the most recent publication that um, I, I led this past year, uh, again, updated, added 15 years of additional data, um, some of the hottest years on, on record for the globe. Um, and then also looked at both temperature and snow. And we looked at other climate indicators similar to what Contasta et al. did in their study. So what did we find? What we're looking at here is the mean um, average temperature for each year from 1935 to 2018 uh, for the Summit and Pinkham sites. So this, the Pinkham is along the top in the round circles and the Summit is the triangles along the bottom. And so then uh, we fit a line to these data points and look at whether that line is statistically uh, significant from zero. Uh, and it, these two sites are indeed both showing statistical warming. And this is the first time that the summit has been recorded as um, statistically warming um, from the different publications I showed earlier. So we are seeing warming at these two sites in the mountains. So as the graph showed with the line fit, what we also tend to report the data out as is a, a, a rise over run or a temperature per unit, um, in this case, uh, 
Fahrenheit per decade. Uh, and so what we're reporting here is the rate of warming over that time period. So it's basically the same data, but using the line fit to report the rate. Uh, and so the Mount Washington summit is uh, coming in at the lowest when we look at um, sites, the Pinkham Notch site, and also look at regions um, by looking over the same time frame, the 1935 to 2018, how do they compare? Um, and Pinkham is actually kind of in the middle between, you know, the Northeast and New Hampshire, and the summit is not too far behind the Northeast um, warming rate for this period. You can also look at it as total degrees warmed over the 84 years that we studied. It's just another way of looking at how ha things have changed. And so the summit has warmed one and a half degrees Fahrenheit, uh, Pinkham over two degrees. So we are seeing significant change in this region. Uh, the U.S. Forest Service has a research site at Hubberbrook Experimental Forest. They also have a fairly long record back to the, the 50s and have done similar um, analyses looking at the rate of warming at different sites and found a, a similar range of 0.2 to 0.5 degrees Fahrenheit per decade. So what we just looked at were annual averages, but what about the seasons? Because of course, I think we can all think of uh, our favorite things to do in the different seasons. Um, and so they may mean something to us, uh, you know, that we can think of fun things in winter and spring and summer and fall, and how might that be changing uh, for us across the region. And for Pinkham Notch, what we're sh showing here is the regional, um, excuse me, the seasonal averages, again, as the rate of warming. So the degrees Fahrenheit per decade and you really don't have to pay close attention to the numbers beyond just the, the height of the bars. And you can see winter is changing the fastest at Pinkham Notch. Um, all the seasons are statistically warming. Um, and the summit uh, has all positive numbers, but only spring and fall are statistically warming. So again, a little bit of a lag happening when we look at uh, the seasonal rates of warming um, comparing the summit to Pinkham Notch. So I mentioned we looked at other climate indicators uh, similar to Contasta et al. and found that both sites were um, behaving uh, similarly where we're seeing indication of uh, changes in temperature um, with 15 to 18 fewer frost days across the two sites, 12 to 14 more thaw days. Um, Pinkham also showed 11 fewer snowmaking days before Christmas, a key time for uh, the ski industry to, to make snow. And both sites were seeing longer growing season uh, that ranged from 15 to 33 days. So this is a graph showing the, um, the growing season start and stop time. And you can see that the, the data points as you go through time are getting further apart, which again indicates that uh, that length of the growing season is extending. So what about snow? Snow is a little bit difficult to uh, analyze for the summit of Mount Washington, largely because it's blowing off into Tuckerman Ravine, right? Um, so we didn't find any trends with the snow data at the summit, which isn't too surprising considering um, that data set. But we did find that Pinkham was consistent with what we're seeing across the region where uh, winter is changing dramatically, and, and that is showing up in the snow record. We're seeing 14 days earlier when the snowpack melts out, 38 less inches for maximum snow depth um, over the, uh, the 84 years, and total snowfall, 68 uh, less inches overall. And again, um, the uh, Hubberbrook Research uh, Station is also seeing shifts in snow indicators. And they looked at maximum snow depth as well. Uh, they get a little less snow than we do up at Pinkham, but certainly are seeing again, um, statistically um, declining trends. And snow cover, that's, um, they looked at the, the number of days in each year that there is snow cover and found 19 fewer days. So all these indications are, are pointing towards 
uh, the climate is changing and, and winter is highly impacted. But I, I do want to uh, remind folks about um, the mountain uh, influences uh, other climate indicators. So when we think about uh, less cold and less snow in the mountains, does that mean losing alpine habitat? Um, it may or it may not because there's other climate drivers, in particular wind, that um, is why we have an alpine zone on Mount Washington is largely because we have winter icing and mechanical damage of the trees that allow um, the light to uh, reach the alpine vegetation that are, that are living there and allow them to survive along with their ability to withstand high wind and um, you know, desiccating winds and all of their strategies that they use to live in that high wind environment. Um, and so we are interested in the next sort of the next steps of uh, what climate indicators we need to update. Um, the wind record on the top of Mount Washington has been looked at uh, Cronin in 2015. Uh, Plymouth State University uh, master's student had looked at some of the wind data and found a slight decline um, looking at 1981 to 2013. And so we are looking to work with the observatory um, to uh, analyze the long-term wind record and uh, relative humidity as well to get a better handle on those climate indicators and how they may impact um, the future of the alpine zone. One of the things that is certain though is that every additional ton of CO2 emissions we put in the air is going to add to the global warming that we're experiencing. Global surface temperatures increase fairly linearly with um, accumulating CO2 in the atmosphere. And this graph basically shows um, the historical warming that's happened, in, again, in the black line uh, related to the CO2 um, emissions. And then you start to, in the cones, you're starting to get into the estimates of different CO2 emission pathways and of course, the more that we emit, the more impact we are going to see. So the, the more we start now in reducing emissions, um, the less impact we will see over time. And so um, there's lots of things you can do. I would say um, get onto outdoors.org and, and put in the search climate change and you can learn more about our climate change research and activities that we're involved in. You can check out our action center, which often has opportunities to, um, to act on policy and regulations that we're working on that address climate change. And something very particular right now uh, that if you're interested in speaking out on um, some bills that are gonna be in the New Hampshire um, Senate next week, uh, there's a hearing on two bills that relate to the New Hampshire Energy Audit and Weatherization Program, which unfortunately has been undermined by a, uh, a PUC decision that really basically takes, takes the winds out of this really important program that um, builds energy efficiency across our state. And so there is an opportunity to, to contact your senators to let them know that you might support a program like this. And if you're interested in, to hear more about that, I can, I can fill you in so you can contact me after. So other ways that AMC has been tracking um, the seasons in the mountains include our plant phenology monitoring, which um, is plot-based and also some, some community science activities using the iNaturalist app, which I'm not going to talk about today, but could another time. Uh, we do, uh, we have canopy cameras that are tracking the timing of uh, green up and fall color change. And most recently, we started um, working with the Community Snow Observation Program to get volunteers and our even our own staff out there collecting snow depth information. And I'm going to tell you a bit more about that. So one of the reasons we've gotten involved in community science or citizen science is because it really helps us fill in the gaps. In mountains, we have lots of gaps. We have 
nooks and crannies. Um, and what this uh, image is showing you is the green dots are our long-term uh, plots where we have trained seasonals go out and track the plant phenology or the plant, the timing of flowering and fruiting um, when they are there for the summer. And what the orange dots are, are iNaturalist observations in between those plots. And so you can see that community science is, adds a lot more data to a data set potentially, um, and can also fill in um, temporally and spatially, uh, and, which is important in mountain landscapes. So community snow observation is, is very similar in its approach. It's basically asking recreationists to collect snow depth information when they're out recreating. And let's see. Uh, the, the project goal is basically to get recreationists to help collect snow depth measurements to improve models, uh, snow distribution models and estimates of snow water equivalents, which I'll talk about why that's important. Uh, AMC is really interested in um, helping, you know, improve models, but we're also really just interested in the variability that we have across mountain landscapes here in the Northeast where, um, you know, we know that as you go up in elevation, you get different uh, snowfall, um, but you also have different vegetation that, uh, you know, coniferous trees may um, block some of the snow from hitting the ground, but it also may retain snow longer into the spring. And so understanding that variability is something we're most interested in. And to participate, all you need is a measuring device. You could use a avalanche probe or a simple ruler, uh, a smartphone and a smartphone app that is free. Mountain Hub is the one that I use. Um, and also a battery, for winter, practically using a battery pack is, is probably important, which if you winter hike, you probably do that anyway. Um, and these point measurements, you know, snow depth measurements, can go into these snow models. And, and as you can imagine, uh, a model is interpolating or, or is smoothing data between points. And so the more points that are in the model, the, the better the, um, the interpolated data set can be. Um, and as I mentioned before, this program also is very interested in using the snow depth information to estimate snow water equivalents which is the total volume of water in that snowpack. And as you can imagine, that's important for um, recreationists, uh, flood management, drought. Um, and it's also important for us in understanding hydrological and ecological systems. So what this project has done is um, out west is where it started, Alaska and, and um, in Oregon, et cetera, they have been collecting um, snow measurements at set plots, much similar to what we do with our plots. We have those plant plots I talked about where we go out and measure at that same place over and over again. In the West, they have um, plots like that called snow tell sites. Um, and so they use their snow tell sites as the, those points on the ground, and then they develop a model um, and this model didn't work out so well. So it should be a one-to-one -one on that, that line should be a good, uh, you know, you have good agreement between your uh, actual ground measurements and your model when it's on the one-to-one -one line. But when they added uh, some community snow correction data to the model, their model agreed quite well with the snow tell data set. And so they've proven on the ground that um, these observations can really help them improve their models. And again, as I mentioned, this started out west. And so they collect this information and then they develop these modeling domains, the red boxes. Um, and I can um, proudly report that they have a, a modeling square over the White Mountain National Forest um, that um, represents the last few years that we've been participating in collecting data. Um, and as I mentioned, this, uh, these observations going into this work has been published um, and has shown that um, the data is, is making a difference in, in their snow models. 
And so here, this is kind of cool that they actually show the volunteer uh, recognized as a co-author on this publication. So it is really easy. These are screenshots of my um, app where I made a measurement um, with a ruler and you can see it on the map right away. And then you see the map of the region and your observations. Um, here's a close up of the uh, observations in the Northeast um, at the end of last year. And you can see that we are getting some good coverage and that has led to the CSO group uh, developing a domain and, and actually reporting in near real time the observations uh, across this region, uh, mostly focused in New Hampshire. And I included the count uh, graph here in the corner to show that most of these observations are happening in January, February. Um, I would say that for AMC's purposes, we are really interested in the shoulder seasons as well. I often say be a hero record a zero because it's really about when the snow leaves that the plants start to respond, right? So snow melt happens, uh, the ground starts thawing and waking up and we get plant development. And we are trying to link this information in the snow work to our plant phenology work. And so we're interested in um, both where there is snow, but also as it melts out uh, across the season. So getting out there in April, if there's no snow on the ground at Pinkham Notch, record that because we're, we are interested. And just to show you how it fills in some gaps in our region, uh, this is a graph of elevation and snow depth. And what I've included here is the red dots are the USGS survey sites. And so this is over a few years, so 2017 to 2021. So it's just a, it just shows you the range of snow depth that they've seen at these sites um, over these years. And then the purple um, you, you see is also uh, snow plots. You can see at the very end there is the Mount Washington summit. And then um, we've got Pinkham Notch showing up around 2000 feet. And then you've got Tuckerman's and I think Hermit Lake uh, showing up there as well. So when we look at the community snow observations that have been taken across the region, it does fill in the gaps. And um, you can see areas where we need even more data filled in, but it is nice to see that this data set is, is really doing what we had hoped, which is to fill in the gaps across the elevation uh, range that we're interested in. And of course, the summit is, you know, reduced probably because of wind, and we might see more of that um, at the higher elevations where we have less data. Um, so it is working. So we're excited to see more of this data come in and start to analyze um, that in relation to um, overall snow pack, but also as it melts out, the timing of melt out across the mountains. So the more we snow, the more we know. So if you're interested and wanna learn more, we have um, a blog on our website that can get you really into the easy steps of how to do this, or just contact me if you have questions. So many thanks to those involved in this. Uh, so many people uh, uh, have been a part of this and I appreciate their, their help and I will open it to questions. All right, Georgia, thank you so much. Um, we're over here taking taking notes in our, our household over here. Um, yeah, so if folks have questions, um, if you want to type them right to the chat feature, um, you can also unmute yourself um, if you would prefer to ask a question that way. Um, one question I have for you, because um, we were just talking about um, the community snow observations and um, you know how it might connect with um, with some of the work that we're doing in high schools and um, and other you know as a possible you know program to bring into the schools for for them to work on um, and. So, and I know this isn't directly what you're doing, but how much of it 
you know, is the push to be recording this snow depth data over the entire region, or are you really is the emphasis really looking at snow depth at you know a variety of elevation and and you know locations uh, specifically on Mount Washington? Um, I would say that the the region um, is important uh, beyond just Mount Washington. Uh, our interest is actually now extended along the Appalachian Trail because we are pairing it with our, our phenology work. Um, so it extends that way. The CSO data, you know, once it's in CSO, anybody can get it out. So, um, you know, what CSO researchers might do with it might be slightly different than what AMC researchers might do with it um, and what a school could do with it as well. Um, but I think that um, once it's in there, it's available to all researchers to use. Uh, for AMC's focused in, you know, we're interested in mountain data, but you know, the low elevation helps to put the higher elevation data in context as well. Um, and the more that we can pair it with where we're doing plant phenology, then we're excited about that. Um, so that's how AMC is going to use it. I think CSO uh, they develop the modeling domains once they've gotten enough data and they also have other data to uh, validate the model. Um, so that, you know, they may not make a domain over, you know, Western Maine unless they get enough data and also have an ability to validate their models. Awesome. Th thanks, Georgia. I actually just started uh, a unit today. It was our first day. I was doing a long-term long snowpack study at one of the high schools. So doing SWE, you know, snow depth, density, all that kind of stuff. And I had been trying to find a good uh, database to submit things to, like a good community science kind of, I wanted like, you know, the US <laughs> Technology Network, but for snow. And I was happy yeah. to find that. So I can't tell you how timely this is. It's incredibly timely. So thank you. That's um, awesome. And I might um, at some point just email you after this because I have a, a couple of follow up questions about how we might be able to um, incorporate it into what you're doing. So I might pick your brain at some point in the near future. Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, I just trained our own winter guides um, and our mountain classroom staff um, just this past week. So I hope I hope we're collectively, yeah, that crowdsourcing capacity is really what these programs rely on. So that's exciting. Wonderful. I have I and I have another question that I had written down as you were going through um, your presentation and you touched on it a little bit. And this is um, not to play devil's advocate, but just bringing up that with based growing season um, in these alpine areas is, you know, just and, and I know that there's more information needed, but you know, the implication for some of the alpine vegetation that, you know, one might, you know, say that in a very hostile, um, you know, growing climate that a, a lengthening growing season, could that be advantageous to some of these smaller <laughs> plants that are trying to make a go of it? Yeah, I mean, that is a good question. And one of the things that we looked at in a paper in 2014, I believe Ken, uh, Ken Kimball was the lead on, was whether frost days are increasing and whether, you know, getting out early may actually, is it a benefit or a deficit if you're out too early uh, because you might then be subject to frost or, you know, you're, if, especially if you've gone to the flowering stage. Um, and we didn't find any, um, you know, increase in frost days. In fact, we're starting to see the opposite, right? Fewer frost days. So um, that may indicate that, yeah, there. Uh, I would expect there's winners and losers to that. You know, if if there's a species that gets out too early and they're, you know, rely on a pollinator that isn't mm -hmm. quite there yet, then that that may be a problem. But um, you know, I think that it it could be a mixed bag, and we don't know yet. Um, and with, you know, it's something we could look at with, we're starting to amass enough data with the phenology that we can start to, to look at whether there is, you know, any indication of 
benefits or not um, for some of these species. And some of them may be driven more by, um, you know, there's other cues to the plants getting out and being active and um, sunlight, you know, the day length is, is one of the variables that uh, is important. So we're trying to figure out what are the important cues for these different alpine plants. Great. We did have just there was because um, I think you know I also saw that the you know the timeliness of the Conway Daily Sun article that ran and just if you're not reading the the chat there was a just a thanks uh, as the Conway Daily Sun sort of listed the climate change study authored by AMC scientist um, just a thanks for for all of your hard work and determination. Uh, Sure, it's a lot, a lot of people coming together. In fact, we had a really wonderful um, intern during COVID, the COVID season. And I think that actually allowed that intern to help us really move the analysis along. And that was a big piece of it. So, you know, it's always a, it's always a joint effort with these types of research projects. Um, so. All right, wonderful. Well, if anyone else has any questions for Georgia um, or comments, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself um, and ask them of her. Um, otherwise, I know I'm trying to think if there were any other ones that I um, that I had here. Are you Georgia? This is. This is Dawson from Tin Mountain. I have a question for you. If we keep going along this route and the line continues pretty much on its current incline, where does that put us in terms of the two degrees Celsius by 2050, 2030? Because I noticed some of your measurements were are in Fahrenheit and it's after five, so I don't convert those temperatures easily. Yeah. I'd have to actually go back and try to, to try to figure that out. And of course, you know, the um when we're thinking of that number, we are thinking of it globally. So we do um, have differences uh, in, you know, like the Northeast is warming the fastest um, in the US, it's one of the fastest warming uh, regions. And so that number I think is associated largely with the global average temperature versus individual locations. And so we have to be careful about, you know, well, the actual rate and, and total warming here may be more or less, um, but the, you know, the tipping point analysis that they're, they're looking towards or, toward, you know, or a, a point that is gonna be really hard to uh, adapt to is based on that global average. Um, so we can't really take our numbers and, and apply it there, but um, certainly uh, the emission, the one graph I showed of the emission pathways we could look at and, you know, you can see it's some of the choices we make uh, related to, um, you know, how do we reduce fossil fuels is really going to play into when are we hitting that number. Um, Go back to that graph. Georgia, do you have, are there thoughts as not you <laughs> specifically, are there thoughts as to why New Hampshire's rate is higher than, um, than the rest of the region? Why the Northeast is higher than the country as a whole? Um, I'm not sure I could answer that. It's probably a confluence of the, just the meter that we have here. Um, but we definitely are warming faster than the region at, a, at our current rate. And it's estimated that we will continue to warm faster. So this doesn't really give ta time, but oh, this is until the year 2050. So um, it's showing the relationship until the year 2050 under these different pathways. All 
Thank you. And the target is the two degrees, two to two and a half. So if nothing changes with that widest band, we, we would hit that in by 2050, it looks like. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Uh, Georgia, thank you so much for uh, for presenting, for sharing, you know, for for collecting and, and analyzing all of this great research and, and taking the time to share it uh, you know, with us today. I think there's, you know, there's a lot, a lot here, and we really appreciate you breaking it down for us. Thanks for having me. It's been great. All right. Oh, yes, lots of, of thank you. So I am going to go ahead and start.